When you think about the performers who were carrying the flag for women's wrestling, many instantly think about the likes of Trish Stratus and Lita, two people who have rightfully been remembered for keeping the division alive at a time when it was often treated as little more than a sideshow. That wasn't to say they were the only two who were working to end this though, because you also had the somewhat forgotten efforts of performers like Molly Holly, Victoria, and of course, Mickey James. Yes, still going strong even when most of her peers have long since retired, Mickey remains one of the unsung heroes of women's wrestling to this day. From wrestling on the indies to her multiple runs with both TNA and WWE, Mickey has proven to be one of the all-time greats. But how did she get to this point? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into her entire career journey so far in Mick Kick, The Mickey James Story. Mickey Larie James was born on August 31, 1979 in Richmond, Virginia to parents Stuart and Sandra, and as a member of the Powhatan tribe, holds part Native American heritage. And though her parents would divorce when she was still a child, Mickey would have a mostly happy upbringing, attending school in nearby Montpelier, and spending a lot of time with her large extended family that included a sister, a half-sister, a half-brother, and three stepbrothers. Aside from that, though, her interests ranged from music to sports, with her learning to play violin during her school years, all well, elsewhere, she was taking part in equestrian sports, something she got an early head start on by frequently visiting her grandmother's horse farm when she was a kid. In the end, though, both of those would fall to the wayside in favor of her main passion in life, pro wrestling, a spectacle which she'd started following after attending a live show with a friend as a youth. And this then would lead to her eventually trying out for the ring herself when she graduated high school in 1999. But despite her desire to get in there and wrestle, Mickey would initially be met with an industry that saw her in more of an eye candy role. And this was what would see her be forced to start out as a valet, working for Kaida Pro Wrestling under the name of Alexis Larie and managing the likes of Tommy Dreamer and Jake Damien. That said, eventually she would get a chance to hit the ring herself when she and Damien took on American Mike Brown and Candy in an intergender tag match later that year, with this being enough to see her want to continue on as a wrestler, as from there she would start attending training camps at Dory Funk Jr.'s Funkin' Conservatory, learning the craft at a rate faster than anyone could have predicted. After that, she would start working as an in-ring performer for the likes of Maryland Championship Wrestling, Ring of Honor, and an early incarnation of Total Nonstop Action Wrestling. But, despite finally getting the chance to live out her dream, she quickly realized that there wasn't a lot of money to be found as an independent wrestler. That's why she must have been thankful when, after a couple of years of having to supplement her income with various side gigs, she fell under the radar of WWE in 2003 with her getting signed to a developmental contract at this time, then being sent down to Ohio Valley Wrestling to learn the in-house style. And so, still using the Alexis Larry name for the time being, the Virginia girl would start appearing in both women's and intergender matches for OVW soon after, proving here that she had the right chops as a wrestler and was more than just a pretty face. Unfortunately for her, though, her rise to the top wouldn't be so easy as, at this point in time, pretty faces that didn't have to do much in the ring were largely what WWE were looking for. And this meant that Mickey would have to fight much harder to establish herself as a serious wrestler, something she began doing when she made her main roster debut on the October 10, 2005 episode of Raw, now working under her real name and acting as a deranged superfan of the, at the time, women's champion Trish Stratus. And this angle would become a quick hit with fans as, while still believing herself to be a babyface, James would get uncomfortably close to her hero on a routine basis, something which caused Stratus to grow increasingly concerned as time went on. Hell, at one point, the rookie would even dress up as the champ during a Halloween costume contest and, following this, would begin mimicking her signature moves during matches. But while Trish would cautiously allow Mickey to remain close to her throughout this period, eventually she would decide things had gone too far when her biggest fan kissed her under the mistletoe that December, with this leading to her beginning to distance herself from there on in. Yes, while this was considered a pretty in-depth storyline for the women's division at that time, WWE still couldn't resist steering it towards titillation for the teenage boys watching. That said, both women were talented enough to work through this as, following that, they had one of the better women's matches in the company at that time when they faced off at the January 8, 2006 New Year's Revolution, with the champ retaining here after a hard-fought battle. 
But that wouldn't be the end of the feud, because they would meet again multiple times over the next few months, with the story now deepening to the point that James would outright declare she was in love with the Canadian, something which Stratus didn't reciprocate, this leading to them facing off again at WrestleMania 22 in a match that was even better than the first. And on that night, it would prove to be the newcomer's time, as she was able to beat the champ to win the WWE Women's title for the first time on the grandest stage of them all. And following this, she would have another couple of rematches with the object of her affections, winning each of these before she moved on to a feud with Lita, the very woman who would end up defeating her and taking her women's title from her on the August 14th episode of Raw. So now having to pick up the pieces again, the Virginian underwent a face turn once more, with this being enough to see her reach her full skill level again as, come November 26th Survivor Series, she would pin Lita to regain her title in what turned out to be the now former champion's retirement match. After that, Mickey would spend 2007 feuding with the likes of Molina as the two traded the belt back and forth for a while, with all this leading to James becoming a four-time champion by 2008. And at that point, Beth Phoenix would get involved in things too, as all three women began staking their claim to be the top star in the division, with the champ successfully defending against both challengers at May 18th, 2008's Judgment Day. But that wouldn't be the end of her beef with the Glamazon as it happened, because Beth would subsequently team up with Santino Morella as the two went on to challenge Mickey and the Intercontinental Champion Kofi Kingston to face them in a winner-takes-all mixed tag match at August 17th's SummerSlam. And unfortunately, it would be on that night that both Kingston and James lost their titles, with the Virginian from there losing direction for a while as she milled around the mid-card. Yes, by now, WWE had fully morphed into the Divas era as, with the likes of Trish and Lita long gone, the division was now dominated by bikini models who often had little interest in wrestling and more interest in using the platform to springboard them to greater fame. And so, as one of the last remaining bastions of women's wrestling in WWE, Mickey would try her best to keep the flag flying as she started a feud with Maurice over the newly rebranded Divas title in early 2009, with this all climaxing in her defeating the Canadian to win the belt for the first time at July 26th's Night of Champions. After that, she would get to face off against a mixture of talent levels as she defended against the likes of Gal Kim, Beth Phoenix, Alicia Fox, and Jillian Hall in the months that followed, with it being the latter who would actually beat her for the belt on the October 19th episode of Raw. So, needing to refresh herself once again then, the former champion would be moved over to SmackDown following this, where she would become part of a controversial angle that saw her routinely be bullied by Laycool for being fat, with the two nicknaming her Piggy James in a moment that made little sense as she was just as slim as any of the other women on the roster at the time. More importantly than that though, this marked a huge instance of hypocrisy from WWE as they were right in the middle of running their anti-bullying campaign Be A Star at the time, something which many were quick to point out as all of this was taking place. And perhaps seeing the bad PR storm they'd unleashed upon themselves, WWE would try to end the story in a happier fashion in January of 2010 when James was able to beat Michelle McCool for the Divas title at that month's Royal Rumble. This would turn out to be short-lived, however, as just a few weeks later, McCool would be the champion once again, with Mickey from there jumping back over to Raw, where she would run out the clock before she was released from her contract later that spring, with this coming after WWE had told her they were going to be moving in a new direction with women's wrestling going forward. But given what that direction would continue to be for Vince McMahon's company, maybe this turned out to be a blessing in disguise for the five-time women's champion, as she was now free to really show what she was capable of, something she immediately set about doing as she made a return to the indie circuit, working for the likes of the World Wrestling Council, Women's Superstars Uncensored, and Maryland Championship Wrestling once again. And ever the entrepreneur, while she was doing this, she was also starting a music career as she would release a country album, Strangers and Angels, in May of 2010, with the debut single from this, Hardcore Country, being released a few months later. Come September of that year, though, her next big break in the wrestling industry would come, as it would be then that she would sign a contract with TNA, who by that point were in a far more stable and established position within the industry. But more important than that, TNA was probably the promotion that was doing the most for women's wrestling in North America at that time, with their knockouts division widely being regarded to be their crown jewel. And with her skills helping her fit right in there then, Mickey would immediately stake her claim to becoming the next knockouts champion as she began working her way through opponents such as Sarita, Tara, and Angelina Love. 
But despite eventually getting her shot at the then-champion Madison Rain soon after this, she would ultimately be unsuccessful in trying to take the title away from her. With this proving to the former WWE star that the level of competition was far higher in TNA at this point. So realizing she would have to dig deep then, Mickey would regroup following a shoulder injury in March of 2011, with her using this time to prepare for her final shot at Reign on April 17th. And it was on that night where, inside of a steel cage, she would finally be able to best the champ, taking the title home for herself and as a result, becoming the first woman in history to hold the WWE Women's title, WWE Divas title, and the TNA Knockout title. Yes, it was a big achievement and vindication for all the years of hard work she'd put in, but things wouldn't end there, because the new champ would immediately be thrown back into the deep end as she had to fend off a series of challengers in the form of Miss Tessmacher and Angelina Love. All this while, as part of a working relationship TNA had with AAA, she would go over to Mexico to do dates there too, even taking part at Triple Mania 19 on June 18th of that year. Meanwhile, back stateside, she would lose her knockouts title to Winter at August 7th's Hardcore Justice after interference from Angelina Love helped to distract her for long enough so as to receive a face full of red mist. Luckily then, the screwy nature of this finish would keep her in the title picture as, after getting her revenge on Love the following week on Impact, she would get a rematch with Winter on September 1st, with her regaining her title here so as to start her second reign on top. But while that run would ultimately be short-lived, with her dropping the title back again 10 days later at No Surrender, James would continue to be a major player in the Knockouts division going forward, often putting on amongst the best matches of any given night. And while she would suffer a number of high-profile losses during this period, she would still remain the consummate babyface. That was until April of 2013 at which point her inability to regain her title began to get to her as, following a loss to the at the time knockouts champion Velvet Sky, she would attack her opponent post-match, with this turning her heel going forwards. And this ended up being just what she needed, as when the time for the rematch came on the May 23rd episode of Impact, Mickey would use her newfound attitude to help her pick up the win this time, taking the knockouts title back in the process as she started her third reign. After that, the new champ would go on a winning streak that saw her defeat a number of high-profile opponents such as Gail Kim and Serena Deeb. In the end, though, she would be dethroned when she came up against ODB on the September 18th episode of Impact, with it later becoming clear that the reason for this was that, behind the scenes, Mickey had been unable to come to terms with TNA on a new contract, and as such, she would be leaving the company. So now a free agent once more, the Virginian began teasing a WWE return when she made an appearance in an interview on WWE.com. Ultimately though, this wouldn't come to pass at that time, as by November of that year, she'd make a return to TNA to take part in the World Cup of Wrestling, becoming a member of Team USA alongside James Storm, Christopher Daniels, Frankie Kazarian, and Kenny King. And around this time, she would also release her second music album, Somebody's Gotta Pay, an album which had been partially funded by fans through a Kickstarter campaign. And this campaign was so successful that she even got to make a music video for the titular first single, one which also featured fellow wrestlers Trish Stratus and James' real-life fiancé Nick Aldis. So focusing on her music career for a while, Mickey took some time away from the ring again following the World Cup of Wrestling. And during this period, she and Aldis would also fall pregnant with their first child, with Donovan Patrick Aldis being brought into the world on September 25, 2014. After that, it was unclear for a while if Mickey would return to the ring at all, but she eventually did so in January of 2015 at an Impact taping in Glasgow, Scotland. And at that point, now playing a babyface once more, she would begin to align herself on screen with Aldis, confronting his heated rival at the time, Bram, and eventually getting talked into competing in an actual match once again. That said, now a new mother, the former Knockouts champion simply didn't have the time to devote to being a full-time performer again at that point, and so, on the June 3rd episode of Impact, she would be written out of the show once again when James Storm threw her onto a train track in a moment that sparked some controversy. And while she would eventually return to TNA to get her revenge on Storm, it would be on a strictly part-time basis, as it would be when she began making appearances for Jeff Jarrett's short-lived Global Force Wrestling promotion that same year too. And part of the reason for this was that, on top of her duties as the mother of a young baby, she and Nick Aldis were now also preparing for their wedding, a wedding that would take place that December. And as well as this, Mickey had also taken up a role as a trainer for the Virginia-based promotion Ground Zero Wrestling, 
there helping to get younger local talent ready to start their own careers. So, with most understandably assuming that her days as a full-time wrestler were done, it came as a surprise when, on November 19th, 2016, she would make her return to WWE at NXT TakeOver Toronto, there challenging Asuka for the NXT Women's Championship in a match that reminded everyone in the company of just how good she was. And this would of course lead to her signing a new contract soon after then, with the former women's champion resuming her main roster duties on January 17, 2017, when she was revealed as the secret partner of Alexa Bliss during her feud with Becky Lynch. After that, she would have her first main roster matches in almost seven years when she teamed with Bliss and Natalya to take on Lynch, Naomi, and Nikki Bella at that month's Royal Rumble. Then from there, returned to singles action when she would be defeated by Becky in a 2 out of 3 falls match on the February 28th episode of SmackDown. Yes, it was clear by now that Mickey's role going forward would be to act as a legend that could help get younger stars over, and this was something she continued to do when she turned face that March and began feuding with her now former partner Alexa Bliss over the SmackDown women's title during the lead up to WrestleMania 33. Following this, both she and Bliss would be moved over to Raw during the 2017 draft, where they would continue their program, now fighting over the Raw Women's Championship. But of course, it would be Alexa who would win out in the end, and so, come 2018, her challenger would be forced to move on to new things as she took part in both the first ever Women's Royal Rumble and the first ever Women's Elimination Chamber match in January and February, respectively. Once this was done though, she would quickly find herself realigning with Alexa Bliss and turning heel once more, usually acting as her backup during this period as she helped her to take on the likes of Nia Jax and Bayley. And in August of that year, she would even get to briefly turn back the hands of time when she teamed with Alicia Fox to take on two of her old rivals, Trish Stratus and Lita, at the all-women's pay-per-view Evolution. After that though, Mickey would return to a fairly inconsequential role on the show, rarely getting to do anything of note, and usually serving as cannon fodder for whoever Bliss's opponent of the month was. Sure, she did get to have a match against Ronda Rousey on the November 19th episode of Raw, and a month after that would get to make history by becoming the woman who had competed in the most matches in the Red Brand's history, but still, there was so much more she was capable of giving even at this point in her career. Sadly though, the company didn't see things this way, and despite moving her over to SmackDown once again in the 2019 draft, it looked very much like she was set to resume her glorified jobber role over there too. That was until a torn ACL suffered on June 1st of that year took her out of action for the next 14 months, with her at this point taking up a role as a commentator on main event as she recovered. And when finally she did recover, the writing was clearly on the wall, as after a brief feud with Lana, she would barely feature on TV at all, with her stock falling so low at this point that she wasn't even drafted at all in 2020. So it happened then that during one of WWE's waves of mass firings on April 15th, 2021, Mickey would be released from her contract, with this release causing particular controversy after she posted a photo online of her belongings being returned to her in a garbage bag something which Stephanie McMahon was quick to reach out to her and publicly apologize for, and which ultimately saw the firing of the person responsible. After that, James would appear at her husband's stomping ground, the National Wrestling Alliance, on June 8th of that year, there announcing that she would be serving as an executive producer to their first ever all-female event, NWA Empower. And as well as this, she also announced that she would be returning to the ring herself at the NWA's 73rd anniversary show, there issuing an open challenge to anyone who wanted to take her on. And both of these events ended up being a big success as it turned out, as NWA Empower became one of the most critically acclaimed shows of the year. All well, at the anniversary show on August 29th, Mickey got to show what she could do once again when she took on and defeated Kylie Ray. But that wasn't the end for her because on October 23rd, 2021, she would also make her return to TNA to challenge and defeat Deanna Perrazzo for the Knockouts Championship at Bound for Glory. And so, now at the top once more, the sky really is the limit for Mickey. What will she do next? Well, that seems to be up to her, with pretty much every company not named WWE currently sharing an open border policy, there's no reason we couldn't see her pop down to Mexico to fight for AAA, return to the NWA to face off against Camille, or even head over to AEW and challenge Britt Baker. Yes, the dream matches are endless, but when you're as good as Mickie James is, that's only to be expected.
So with that in mind then, we hope to see her continue on for a while and prove what so many people already know. And that's that, when it comes to women's wrestling, she really is one of the best to ever do it. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.